Hello, everybody. We're ready to start. Um, this is uh, a studio class for my students and friends and anybody who's interested. Um, today, we're going to be focusing on coloratura. And so I just want to talk a little bit about the biomechanics of coloratura and how to work on it. And then we'll have four or five singers demonstrate music that they've been working on that incorporates various elements of flexibility. Um, I'd like to just introduce this by saying that if you think that coloratura and scales and flexibility is something that is not something that your voice is designed to do, you want to rethink that because all voices can move. Because singing is movement. That's been kind of my mantra lately. Singing is movement. Obviously, it is movement that expresses many things. And there are just all kinds of nuance and um, musicianship and dramatic interpretation that we can bring to the things that we sing. But as a voice teacher who's very interested in technique and pedagogy, I like to break things down into the movements that create certain things. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about the movements that create coloratura and flexibility, and then we'll get to work on it. Um, so if you want to create a note and then make it go to another note, <laughs> um, how we tune the vocal folds, the movements that tune the vocal folds is of paramount importance for talking about scales and coloratura because there is so much movement in these passages. Uh, but it breaks down to something pretty simple. When your vocal folds are short and thick, we produce low notes, heavy registration. When they get stretched long and thin, we produce high notes, light registration. So moving back and forth between longer and shorter is how we change pitches. And that might not seem like it's such a big deal when you're singing a long, sustained phrase and you're not moving from pitch to pitch very quickly. But when you're singing coloratura or scales or trills or anything that involves flexibility, it seems like you've got to make these movements very, very, very quickly. And actually, the way that most scales and coloratura proceed happen too quickly for us to be able to do these things mechanistically. If you're going to play a scale at the piano, then you have to mash each key individually. Um, but we don't really have keys in our throats or pads and holes that we can cover up and, and individually produce these tones. Um, the amazing thing is that we don't have to because it's the ear that tunes the voice. It's the ear that uh, determines how long your vocal folds are going to be, how short they're going to be, if you allow it to. So I just want to try to make this whole process very simple. These very complicated passages that you're about to hear these singers uh, sing all break down to very simple movements. Uh, for example, if I want to do a simple five note scale quickly, if I just move between those two pitches, ah, on a siren, that's a very simple movement for me. Ah, my chords get a little bit longer and thinner, and they get shorter. So the movement that I'm going to do if I want to sing a scale that encompasses this interval is going to be a very similar movement to what that siren is. Ah, I don't have to lurch my throat around or find the placement for each pitch if I can really trust my ear to find it. However, because we often learn to um, match pitch by positioning our throats around when we're kids, and we all start out as self-taught, we might have this idea that we've got to like find each of these notes in our throat and then just do it faster and faster and faster, sort of like click up the metronome. That's what I thought when I first started singing because that's what had worked for me as a clarinetist but the voice doesn't work quite the same way. There are some things about it that are more facile and easier, some things that are a little bit more complicated, but you definitely don't want to have to go, ah, because no matter how smoothly I try to do that, if I'm really sort of manipulating my throat to find each of these pitches, it's always going to be a little bit more clunky than if I just, ah, let my ear find the pitch. Now, when you first start getting used to letting the ear tune the voice for these very rapid passages and, and scales, you have to risk the possibility that it might be a little bit out of tune. And that's okay, because learning how to stabilize the pitch of your voice at a rapid tempo is similar to any other physical activity that you would engage in. Sometimes you have to practice by going slow and then going a little bit faster. Uh, and sometimes you have to stabilize it by actually, maybe you do have to feel where things are and get feedback from other people to let you know whether you're in tune or not. But that's kind of just like the training mills on a bicycle. They're there to stabilize you so you don't topple over. And then they take the training wheels off and then you're gonna be a little bit wobbly in the seat of your bicycle for a while. But eventually you figure out how to let 
momentum in your intention to go someplace be the thing that keeps you upright and well balanced in the seat. And for me, coloratura is the same way. You have to be willing to do some very sort of reckless, swipey things so that eventually you figure out how to allow the momentum of your breath and of the music and of your dramatic intention to be the thing that steers you from note to note throughout the entire passage. Um, so with that, I will stop talking and we can start listening to some singing and see how to apply these ideas practically. I'm Joanna Geffert. I'm a mezzo-soprano. I will be singing Or la Tromba from Handel's Rinaldo. This is the eighth aria that Rinaldo has in this <laughs> show, uh, which I will be singing in a concert production at the end of next month and beginning of August. So really excited to work with you on this. Um, I'm only singing, I, I'm, I should say I'm not singing the da capo, so just the A and B and then we'll stop there. Okay. Okay. Can you just tell us a little bit about what's happening? What are you talking about? And Sure. Um, I, uh, Rinaldo is a warrior. He's a lieutenant in the army and he's getting ready, I believe, to go back into battle or he's got a new battle plan. And so he's talking about how the trumpets are sounding him, uh, or are sounding and are summoning him to triumph. And uh, my favorite part in the B section, as a warrior and a lover, glory and love will make me happy. So he's, he's a simple man, but he knows what he wants. into what the original melody would have been. Okay. So if I could just ask you to sing just this very first phrase and stop there. Yeah. So right from where she starts. Right on it? I'm gonna take it a tick faster. Okay. Or attempt to at least. <gasps> Sing it that way for me. You understand what I'm doing? No, so without the middle note there. Mm -hmm. 
pine swamp est mm -hmm. And then stop there. Okay. with sound festive summons me to triumph. Excellent. Now, could you speak that in rhythm while, can you play the whole thing with the melody? Mm -hmm. But I just want to stay away from it, just, just or la trombone swan, and just deliver the text. Sure. In rhythm. Right on it? Yeah. Or la trombone swan, presante mi richiamo triunfar. Now notice how hard it is because you've only learned this <laughs> to not actually insert those little re-articulations. Yeah. But I want you to get to the point where you feel like you just have this continuous stream of expression. Okay. Um, because all of these little ornaments are there to help the expression, mm -hmm. right? Not to, um, they're there to uh, intensify certain things, mm -hmm. um, but they're not there to draw attention to themselves. You're gonna sing all the notes, but if you can do it within the context of just delivering this phrase. Okay. So one more time, someone said, or la trombone, but or la trombone swan festante. Sure, so okay. Or la trombone swan festante mi richiama triunfar. I want you to do that one more time. Okay. Or la trombone swan festante mi richiama triunfar. It's hard, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a simple thing that I'm asking you to do, but it's not that easy to do. Now, I like you with that attitude that this is the statement that I'm making. Um, do the simplified version that we talked about before. So that you're still just giving me this very continuous line, mm -hmm. but it's going to have this shape now. Okay. Yeah. Now that sounded very legato to my ear. How did that feel to you? Good. Okay. It sounded great. Thank you. Um, because I felt like when she sang for the first time, it was good. But I felt like the coloratura was drawing attention to itself, right? Fair, yeah. Not, not helping her to articulate and you know the, the text and tell the story. Do that one more time. Okay. Good. Now sing that much as written. Don't think so much about this, but think about what you're saying. Okay. And, and what I want you all to help with is like, how does it make, how does it help? The character. How does it tell help the storytelling for there to be these added notes? Okay. Okay, so just that much as written. <laughs> Any observations? How does this sound different when those extra notes are there versus when they're not? It sounds like a trumpet. It sounds more like the trumpet. And then we will we have a trumpet playing with you? Yes. This ideally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um but it's there to sort of like help the expression of the text rather than uh than anything else. Now, um we'll come back to more of the sort of fast articulation later, but let's look at this repeated little trilly type thing you have to do. Great. Um, uh, let me hear you just move between that A and that B a little bit more sort of swoopy and legato, a way that you never would for Handel, but if you can go, oh, Out of context? Yeah, out of context, just like that. slower and slider, especially on the way up. Oh, just sort of bend it. Good. So what I'm asking Joanna to do is, is to just practice the movement that's going to become this more ornamental figure, but in a way that's a little bit less jarring and feels like maybe you need to get like something else involved, like maybe your breath or your body, 
if it's really just this very smooth movement of your, your vocal folds getting a little bit longer, a little bit shorter. Uh, one more time. Oh, oh. Now, what if I asked you to do that a few times and then just sing some 16th notes? So something like, singing coloratura this way, trust that your ear is going to be the thing that's going to, you know, stabilize it and mm -hmm. define the pitches better so that you don't feel like you have to grip onto each one with your throat because it just goes by too fast to be able to do that. So one more time. <laughs> now, that time it felt like you were tempted to do something else. Mm -hmm. um, do you know what it was? What did you notice? I, um... Yeah, it's like I want to add more vibrato to make it more in my ear, coloratura appropriate. Well, um, don't do that. Try it this way. Okay. Try it this way, um, because there are other ways to approach coloratura, um, but I think all of them, the the um, strategies that I'm familiar with, um, still require that you just simplify things and just honor the way that the vocal folds actually move and tune the note. Um, my first voice teacher, I think, told me that my, um, my coloratura had to be the tempo of my natural vibrato. And I know other people have taught that way. But I want to be able to vary the speed of my coloratura. I don't want it to have to be the speed of what my vibrato is. And the, you know, the irony at the time is that my vibrato was a little bit exaggerated and distorted because my technique was a little bit tight. So my vibrato wasn't even really my vibrato. Mm -hmm. um, there's also uh, the possibility of inserting some super low ages. Ha, 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 ha. Mm -hmm. And that is also uh, a really effective way to do things. But if it starts here, then those other strategies will enhance what you're doing. So start by just finding out like what's the minimum thing you have to do to tune your voice. Okay. One more time. So. Yeah, da, 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 ba, ba, yeah. This stuff. Oh yes. And 
the way that trumpets change pitch is very different from the way that the human voice changes pitch, right? We've got to stretch our vocal folds longer for high notes, shorter for, for low notes, but the trumpet can overblow these intervals. So chances are, I don't know the part, and I'm not exactly sure what the instrument is that, that Hempel would have written this for, but this is idiomatic for the trumpet, which means you've got to find a way to make it idiomatic for you. Now I felt as you went, went on, it sounded more like it was all in one place, but for a singer, we're more likely to go, ha, 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 and have the high notes and the low notes feel like they're not in the same place. Yeah. Um, so I would just like to see if instead of feeling like the movement for this passage has to be like that, this kind of angular thing, if it can feel more like that. Okay. Um, so. What have you found? Uh, well, I just want to make a little exercise out of it. Um, so we've got this, this octave leap from E to E. Can I hear those E's? Yeah. Can I hear you go? Oh, 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 oh. It already sounds like both notes are more in the same place. Okay. Um, and I think you can go even farther in that direction. So do that little siren exercise again and see if you can have the rate of pitch change be very even. Oh, 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 oh. Temptation is always going to be oh, surge a little bit when you have to get back up to the high note, but we want to feel like she's just playing her trumpet here. Um, so let me hear you go oh, from the E to the A. Oh, 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 oh. So you've now gone through the movements of all of these wide intervals in a way that seems very comfortable same place for you. Mm -hmm. um, so try singing that passage again and see if you can just have it be, see what happens. So this is, yeah, Miri Kiyama. Miri Kiyama Triuna Orientating the trumpet here. Mm -hmm. um, so let's practice that again. This is an A up to an E. So is it? How does this go? Uh, the C sharp? So, so, mm -hmm. You're welcome to, but see if you can for now just sing oh, and really have feel like it's all on one on one level instead of accenting yeah. the, the E up here. Yes. Okay. <laughs> really nice. Yeah. Yeah, because before it was more than you needed. The note mm. just kind of jumped out at us a little mm -hmm. bit. But all you have to do is stand there and sing that note, and we're gonna it's it's going to jump out because of the way that Handel wrote it. Okay. Um, okay, start it again and then keep going. Okay. So we can do a little bit of this stuff too. Yeah, okay. The top note? Um, yes. Yeah. The top. Right on. Going this fast. 
fast, you can't do that. You yeah. can't go, ha, 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 ha. I mean, you could, but don't. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. It'll be prettier if you just do like this simple little subtle movement that the trumpet has to do. Uh -huh. I mean, here you go, ha, some sort of more diatonic scale passage. maybe the first of each group of four, maybe 
the last. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of different ways that you can break it down. But breaking it down into like manageable little moments that then build up to be something that's more of a, of a complete line gives you more to work with, right? Because then you've got, you, you, instead of just having like a sequence of like 16 little notes that you have to sing all of them, mm -hmm. then you're going to be paying a little bit more attention to the broader arc or shape of the line. Uh, do that one more time for you. And see if you can just let your throat, uh, your throat obey your ear so it doesn't. So you're more warmed up, yeah. you're like more back in the groove of, of what this is. Um, but continuing to, um, to just let your ear find the pitches. I still kind of feel like you're, throw, you're letting your throat kind of find these notes. And uh, so let's do one more thing with this passage. Okay. And slide between the pitches. to these sensations in our throat, um, it's hard, it can be a little bit hard to let go of. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to do one more thing with this, which is here, this stuff that precedes all of that is very trumpety. Let me hear you say again. Or la tromba in son festante. Or la tromba in son festante. Good. Now speak that, and can you play that for her? Or la tromba in son festante. Then again, you're sort of subverting the intent of having you turn into a trumpet. Mm -hmm. where all of these notes really are in the same place because they're all part of the same original series. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll sing the whole thing again from 20. And actually, let's do one more thing. Can I have a B and an E? So. sequences and like truly trumpety type things um, but if you can sort of like break these things down into first of all I always start with you know what are you saying mm -hmm. and if you can sort of just speak through the text in rhythm with the attitude that you would want without re-articulating all the little notes then you have the underlying idea that you're communicating and then if you can further strip it down to find out like what is the structural melody that Handel or another composer might be ornamenting mm -hmm. and anchor your ear to that. And then within that, if there are these little trilly movements, how can you simplify them so that you're really hearing both of the notes, but just letting your throat move back and forth between them? Mm -hmm. um, we talked about these arpeggiated figures that sort of resemble what the trumpet would be doing and just doing little exercises to remind your body that like it's not like this note's over here and this note's over here. 
your vocal cords are about three quarters of an inch long, and they, you know, they might stretch a little bit, but they're not going very far. All these things really are in the same place. Um, and then the simpler and the smoother you can make all of this, then you have the freedom to shape these phrases the way that you want to, mm -hmm. so that you're always in character. Because Ronaldo, you know, the way that you're describing him, he doesn't have a care in the world. Mm. Um, he, he's going to triumph, and this is another sign that, that all will be well. And so the more sort of like groundedness and confidence you can project in stillness, while all of these roulades come flying out of your throat, the more fun you'll have, the more mm -hmm. fun we'll have, and the better you'll be able to allow all of these ornaments to express the character and his attitude and the story that he's telling, rather than you know a successful but effortful display of virtuosity. Mm -hmm. so I'm really glad you're working on this. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Devin, can you keep us in the hold of the Baroque? I would love to. Yeah. I'm going to need the stand though. Yeah. <laughs> I'm saying that because of the piano reduction. I love Purcell. I love this aria. Do you want the whole intro? Or just um, uh, the whole, I, intro, right? whole intro. And can you just tell us who you are and what this is? Okay. And yeah. So my name is Devin Bain. I'm going to be singing A Rise East Subterranean Winds from The Tempest by Purcell. And in this aria, I am a demon who has been summoned by Prospero to basically call up the winds and um, kind of smite these guys who have been shipwrecked and torment them.
Yeah, there's going to be a lot of notes yet tonight. Yeah. Um, now, you did it. I did it. You did it. Yep. And you should be really happy with, with, with the way that went. Now, I heard Devin do this in, in his lesson the other day, and you performed it from memory a couple of times. Yeah. And when you performed it from memory, I felt like you were really embodying this character, and I could see what you were seeing, and yeah. it had an impact on your phrasing. That's probably true. Um, so now that you know that we all heard you do it, we all know that you could do it, yeah. um, I wonder if you'd be willing to just do a little bit of this um, from memory so you can just feel what the, what the difference is. Okay. Um, because again, we're here talking about um, coloratura, we're talking about this technical, pedagogical, biomechanical element of how the voice works, but it's dramatic motivation that always has to come first. Because if you try to fix something in the absence of what you were trying to express, then you might tweak and you might do things and you might try these exercises, but if the very thing that was causing the problem is the fact that you weren't saying what you meant to say, then it's not going to really improve things. So I just want to have the opportunity to really sort of unleash your full fury on us. So let's just go from the beginning to um, all, all the, the, the fixed and solid center shake. Okay. Okay, so just the first few pages. Without the repeat, um, though, probably. Or with the repeat. With the repeat. Okay. With the repeat. Well, I, you want me with to stand here and okay. yeah. demonic. Okay. Yeah, you're going you're yeah. gonna, to be demonic. Okay. And then I'll give cool. you the music back. All right. If you're sufficiently demonic. Okay. Full, <laughs> full intro or? Yes, because he's got to act this. Oh, yeah, of course. You know, if you're going to use it in auditions, then you have to show us what you would be doing. Sort of. checking in and like, what's the next note? And yeah. how is that scale going? Yep. Um, so this is instructive for all of us to realize that um, it's so important to just let go of all that because what's the worst thing that's gonna happen? You're gonna sing a wrong note, you're gonna get lost, we'll start over again. This is just a very informal studio class. Um, not that the, and the stakes really aren't that much higher when you're performing necessarily, but you're gonna be a lot more prepared. Yeah. Um, you have a lot more rehearsal, but you may as well enjoy it because being focused on what you're doing dramatically is going to help your voice, mm -hmm. and um, and you'll you'll see with everybody else who's singing too, what you are intending is what comes through in your face and in your voice, and so because the voice doesn't lie, if what you are intending is I'm going to smite these guys, we're going to see that, and if what you're intending is I'm going to sing all the right notes, we're going to see that too, and then this is the problem because you go back and forth between between being this very committed, dramatic presence and then being Devin managing his voice. Yeah. Um, and so we need you to be one thing for, for all of it. Um, now, Devin's come a long way with this aria. Um, 
I think that relatively speaking, your neck is even stiller, <laughs> right, than, than it was the other day yeah. when you sang this for me? That's, yeah, I think so. Because um, he had been articulating all of the pitches with, with a little bit of head movement, yeah. um, which feels like it helps, but it doesn't. No. Um, and especially when you're talking about how like you, you're going to make all but the fixed and solid center shake, and you are the fixed and solid center, right? So you're going to shake them. You're going <laughs> to shake all of nature. But you're going to be unshakable. So. Um, before we actually get into the, the nitty gritty of the music, um, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, no, I just want to give him a simple movement that's it's going to sort of help with 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 breath management because it's going to keep it keeps your chest open, it keeps your shoulder stabilizers engaged. But if you do some one thing smoothly, then probably the rest of your body is going to be doing something smoothly too. That's the, that's the instinctive um, thing to happen. So let me hear you just sing the and solid center shake. Uh, but first I'd like you to just sort of pull on the band and figure out like where's a good resistance. If you put your hands closer together, it makes it stronger. How yeah, far out my arms be going? Well, just for the length of this phrase. So and solid center shake. So if you're trying to okay. go fully. Well, not necessarily. This is not a workout for your back. This is to give you something smooth to do okay. so that your voice will then mimic it. Cool. Okay, so speak that for me. And solid center shake. Alex, can you play that for us while he does this? And solid center shake. Keep going, keep going, yes. Okay. So end up here. Yes. Okay. Okay, because the, the energy, the effort of your singing um, is continuous. Yeah. Just because the pitch goes down or there's no more fat no, fast notes doesn't mean that you come in like that. Okay, okay for the sake of this exercise. Okay. Do, do that again. And so yeah. I want you to do it one more time and I want you to see if you can pace it okay. so that it happens a little bit more along the lines of how long it would take you to sing the phrase. And so and so right now your body looks very focused and grounded. Um, I want you to go from all but the fixed, all, all but the fixed. And so each time you start a phrase, return and then smoothly stretch it. See what happens. All but the fixed, all, all but the fixed. I know it's just an exercise. It's just an exercise, but the thing is, the sort of stretchiness of what you need to do with your whole body to be able to get through a phrase like this is not so different because you've got to like maintain stability for your body and for your breath management. And so if you try to sing something before your body is ready to, it won't go as well as if you do wait for it. So that what that suggests to me, it doesn't take very long to go from here to here, right? But it does take some time. So when you go all about the fix, be ready. Okay, do all that again. All about the fix. All, all about the fix. And so all it's to shake. Much better. Yeah. So any observations about that? Yeah, he's even more centered when he's doing it the second time. Yeah. It's hard. It's coordination. Like the coordination, yeah. You could see the coordination between that. Yeah. Actually, let's do it one more, one more time. Okay. Because the thing is, if this is, this is standing in for you. This is actually mimicking some of the coordination that you have to do, right? Because as you sustain a long phrase, especially a long phrase that's got a lot of coloratura in it, right? As there's less air in your lungs, if you're not really paying attention to your alignment and your breath management, then you might end up going like this and squeezing the air out that way, right? So to counter that, the muscles that he's using to maintain and increase tension on this band are actually some of the muscles that are stabilizing his rotation, his shoulders and sternum. Let's do it one more time. All but the fixed.
Um, was it as accurate as when you were really focusing on just singing it? Yeah. No, but that's fine because we can work on this piece of it and we can work on other pieces. But, um, but the kind of continuity that kept you doing one long thing rather than dun -dun 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 mm -hmm. and getting your neck involved is also an important part of being able to do this well. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so one of the challenges of this piece, you know, you were saying this was the hardest phrase, and you sang yeah, it really, really I practiced well. it the most. Let's <laughs> 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 show it off now. Okay. Um, so there's a phrase whose rapid force can make First it does a descending scale C to C, and then F to low F. And descending scales, um, I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to talk about this more uh, in, in the class. Descending scales people usually find more difficult because we don't think of them as being you know, challenging. We think about like going up from a high note as being the hard thing. But actually, um, as I understand it, more injuries come you know, from going down the mountain after you climbed up it, right? then happen on the way up because people aren't paying attention, but the act of lowering yourself and sort of like allowing your voice to sort of move in this descending direction requires just as much attention, focus, as going the other way. So can I just have that, that seat that it starts on? Okay, so actually just sing the phrase first so we can hear it. Who's ra? As written. Yeah, as written, yeah. Who's ra? So the exercise that we worked on for this was to go ah, got a nice ah vowel, rapid. Um, so that we're just doing the shape of the phrase, C to C and then F and then down. Do that, that, that for us. Ah. Ah. Function that the bow has 
on a stringed instrument is very similar to the function that your breath has on your voice. And so we all tend to like spend everything, and then there's just a little bit left for like the, the last few. So see if you can pace a little bit better. Arise, arise, ye And the direction that it's going in Devon, um, again, it's not as perfectly accurate as when he was doing what he needed to do to like make sure every note's gonna be right, but it's quite accurate and your neck's more relaxed. So this is going in the direction of like being able to ride your bicycle without the training wheels, right? Yeah. You're gonna figure out how to stabilize it with your breath and with your ear, with everything that you do to just you know maintain your alignment, and it's gonna get more, more accurate. Okay, so what 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 do you want to have happen for this last phrase? Um, have the pitches be accurate, which I think was you know, kind of a problem. It, you know what? It went better. It, it went a lot better than you think it did. Okay. Um, I would love it if you breathe. <laughs> Before yeah, the last. That would be helpful. Um, okay, so let's just hear this rise and obey from the bottom of uh, yep. one or two. Just, yeah. So. yeah, okay. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> rise and obey. Rise and obey. Rise and obey. to revisit the handle after looking at, uh, at a different style. Okay, Veronica, do you, do, you, do you need the music? Sorry? If you don't really need the music, have it nearby. Yes. Um, have, it, have it nearby, but if it's right there, then you're going to be tempted to just stare at it the whole time. Yes. I, I'd like okay. to see you perform okay. this piece. Yeah. So I'm Veronica, hi, 
and I'm going to be singing Adele's laughing song. Adele is a maid who has borrowed her mistress's dress without her permission and goes to a party without her permission and there she meets the husband of the mistress and she tries to convince him that she's not the maid but some glamorous lady. situation is 
but there are always some things that we need to keep track of. And if there's one thing that's worth keeping track of, it's just reminding yourself to breathe. Um, so some of the things that didn't work as well as, as, um, as I know that you can do it had to do with the fact that you weren't getting in mm -hmm. as much air and starting yeah. the phrase. So um, um, we're going to work with that a little bit. But before, uh, before we talk about that, um, let's just talk about subtext. Um, it's so interesting because we have um, some Purcell and some Handel, and uh, composers love to use these melismas, cadenzas, coloratura to help express the emotion of what's going on. In Joanna's aria, it was expressing the sort of virility, right, and, and warlike nature of the character. Um, and then Devin came up and was using his coloratura to be demonic and to cast spells. And now Adele's using the coloratura to make fun of Eisenstein, mm -hmm. right? So the, text, the subtext for all of his coloratura is very, very different from the, um, from the coloratura that we've heard from the other two pieces. And you have to find ways to just let yourself laugh with it. Um, so let's just get your, your breath a little bit more relaxed. Um, the first note that she comes in on is the, is the G. Can I have that? So I want you to get a good breath and go. situation because he actually part of him is not sure whether you're his mate or not <laughs> so having that ca that aspect of the character you know really help you sort of settle into your body do that again just mine hair marquee mine hair marquee i mod be z i mod be z could you perform that uh, a little bit, just sort of speaking in a sustained yeah. way, yeah. and like you're talking to him and making fun of him? So if you just play, play for us. Mine have a key. I'm a Die 
actually get yourself to reflexively laugh and then work it in so that it's on pitch, not only will it sound really cool, but you'll probably get the audience to laugh as well. And in an audition, that's a great thing because you want to show them a good time and they're having a hard day. We often forget about that, but it's, it's tough to sit there for hours and listen to all of these singers and try to figure out what to do with, with all the talent that, that comes before you. So let's just laugh a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, see, you're pretty good at that. <laughs> okay, everybody, uh, who's got a joke? <laughs> Anybody have a joke? You're not going to make me tell my bad joke again. We are. You are. <laughs> Maybe you all know this by now. Some of you won't know it. Um, I don't know it. <laughs> what do John the Baptist and Winnie the Pooh have in common? <laughs> Their middle name. <laughs> I think you can laugh at my terrible joke or laugh at how stupid I am. Um, but, but you can sort of feel what's happening. What happens when you laugh? <laughs> it's this sort of, you know, reflexive series of, of convulsions that happens that you can trigger, but um, you don't necessarily have any control of it. So where, where's the D that starts the scale? Okay. So first just sort of do the movement of how do you get from the D to the A. Good. So that's not hard for you. Now can you go? sound to really get yourself to Oh, oh. Where did you stop? I don't know. 
know something. Yeah, it's panic. Nope, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> we can yeah. breathe after. Yeah, can't yeah, breathe, breathe and I just go on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can I do it again? Yeah, do it again. Die Hand ist am Wogen zu fallen. Die Füßchen so zierlich und klein. Thank <laughs> you. 
care more about what the character is doing and saying yes. than about whether or not your voice is working because you know it's just your your voice loves moving like this. Mm -hmm. um, so entertain yourself, Keisha, and then you'll entertain us as well. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. <laughs> So Isha, would you mind starting with a reveal? Yes. And then we'll possibly look at the handle. You do from the Yeah. yeah. than the kind of flexibility that Veronica could have when she was singing with Strauss. Um, but it's with these stranger intervals and tonalities. So the process is still the same. You have to get these, these phrases into your ear, and then your voice will follow suit. But it has to start by getting in your ear. So if we could go back to, let's just do um, the first incidence of coloratura, um, top of 27. Da -da 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 just do it from here to there. Mm -hmm. So, so she just la fragile la fragile. Okay. Oh, 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 oh. And you hear that she's not getting a whole lot of help from the orchestra. Mm -hmm. It's very exposed. So you have to have these pitches and these intervals very, very well in your ear. Um. So could you just play the notes that go with the very first little ah mm -hmm. there? Good. So, oh, oh, good. Now go back and forth a little bit. We're just going to practice sort of like how does the voice have to move to do all the notes that are contained within this interval. Oh, oh, oh. Right, so that's the range of motion that she needs for this phrase. But then tonally, where is it going? Oh, is that right? Did I end up on the B? Oh, oh, oh. Good, do it again. Oh. The top note seems to me like it's a little bit under-energized. And I think that if you just give a little bit more dramatic subtext, because what you're doing is going boom, right? Yeah. Oh. Do you know where this note is? I didn't no, know I hear that was 
person. Oh. display of what fire is because Ravel is such an amazing orchestrator so this one come in confidently because you're the one who's starting what we're doing right okay. now and then you're gonna have to bounce the second entrance yeah. off that yeah. okay go again good good okay so now let's look at this last one solve that. 
is how do you take a breath fast enough to change there? Because you have to breathe after the arpeggiated figure when it goes into this diatonic scale, there has to be a breath. And even if the piano is gonna wait for you, you don't feel like you have the time because the fire is burning, it's burning, it's burning. And you know, if you stop, then you, you ruin the momentum. So that I think is the main challenge. How do you take that breath? Not how do you sing this stuff. But let's look at the shape of these phrases. Um, um, so can I just hear that first arpeggio? Okay, so that was pretty good, but I felt like the energy was a little bit uneven. Okay. Now that was better. I feel like you're driving the high note. Yeah. And that little bit of unevenness, she might get away with it, but it's going to cost her a little bit of extra energy. See if you can just keep it very. Oh, 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 like that first little flip where she didn't really want to go all the way down to the A. And this is one of the things that can happen in wide range of cadenzas and coloratura phrases, is that we want to sort of like set a position that's going to work for all the notes in the scale. And there is no position. Everything's just moving around back and forth, and it's just your ear that moves. So anything that you set in your throat for the sake of, of keeping it secure is going to subvert your musical intention. Okay. So just have it be as sort of flabby as you can. Oh, let it go all the way back down. Oh, and she did it. Now that time she erred in the side of like I'm gonna make sure that I know where the low note is, but then you sort of set a different position that didn't include the high note. Good. There's no <laughs> position. You just have to be, you know, you just have to burn and burn. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um. Uh, sing this whole section as written, and then stop where that terrible breath has to be. Okay. Oh. Good. Now, the part that we worked on, I thought went really, really well. These, you still have to get down to the low note, which in this case is only an A, right? It's not that low. But I think that's one of the reasons why you feel like you're not getting down to the lowness in the scale that follows, because you've kind of like gotten wedged into a high position that you can't like okay. extricate yourself from soon enough. Okay. So, oh, so it's, oh, do that for me a few times. The last one was in tune. Oh. The others are still a little bit in the high center. Sure. Shooting, are you saying something? Do you really mean what you're saying? Because if you don't have the right idea, then that's the first thing to look at. But after that, what is your intention? Yeah. Because if your ear knows where the notes are, then your voice can follow. But if you just sort of have like a shape of the phrase, but you don't really commit to singing that A, right. you're not gonna sing the A. Okay. Probably not gonna sing the A. Okay. Or even if you do, you won't sing it like you meant it.
beat, you're not getting a whole lot of support from the orchestra where the beat is until the end, yeah. and you have to turn around in the right place. Yeah. And it's really kind of the same thing over and over again. It just expands a little each time. So how does it go? Oh, that's how it starts. That's all it is. Do that for me once. It's easy if you know that that's what it is. Right. And if you have time to take the breath. Then it's going to expand a little bit. And then that's all that happens next. Yeah. You start on the E, you have to get down to that E, right? right? So that you know where you're going. Oh, so it goes E to D, E to E, E to F, natural. Yeah. Okay, so, so the whole thing's gonna go something like, Oh, 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 oh,
high C class next time. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That, that Beverly isn't going to be able to join us this evening, so we'll find another opportunity to, to work with her. Um, do you guys have any, any questions or anything else that you want to look at, or Aisha, if you wanted to take a look at, at the handle piece that you were that you prepared? or Sure. Hopefully I won't face plant as bad. Let's okay. see. Explain oh. to us why um, you had this, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because um, it would also be interesting to hear you sing this repertoire after, after what you just did. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us a little about this piece and how it came to be in your binder. Um, so this um, aria, this Un Pensiero Nemico di Pace, is from Handel's cantata Il Trionfo del Tempo del E del Disengano. But I, did, I had heard the original first. Oh, you did? Yeah. But I was doing this concert for Gen Z. Um, which was about pairing different characters together. And I, I think you had actually shown me this, the aria from The Enchanted Island, which was, which is this pastiche um, that was commissioned. Do you guys know what the, the Enchanted Island is? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. It's a mashup of The Tempest and Midsummer Night's Dream that they, um, that they produced <laughs> at the Met a few times to great success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, didn't, I thought it was a terrible idea. They just, they just drew on Baroque works. <laughs> Um, and then it was magical. It was absolutely magical. Um, yeah. And this is one of the lesser known arias that they made it into, but they, they wrote new English words for it. Right. It's much more singable in the Italian. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm singing the original in Italian, which is sung by the character Bellezza, who's apparently beautiful, and she is sad that time will wither away her, her looks, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, I heard it very fast, and I remember yeah, you know, that it was lower. when you have the opportunity to sing a legato phrase mm -hmm. that, that provides that contrast because that's where a lot of the story is going to be told. So while the text setting is very syllabic at the beginning here, I'd love to hear you take a broader approach so that it doesn't sound like it's all getting chopped up because there's going to be a little bit more of a sense of like things moving fast and being percussive and being chopped up once there are these, these 16 notes. Um, but let me just hear you say, Un pensiero nemico di pace. Un pensiero nemico di pace. One of the things that will make it more legato is if you harmonize that first N with the P. Right. Un pensiero. Un pensiero nemico di pace. Un pensiero nemico di pace. Un pensiero nemico di pace. Good. Now, what, she, what we're doing is we're emphasizing a little bit more just the rhythm of the language, less than 
the rhythm that handle wrote for it. Because to be accurate, if all I care about is the rhythm, I don't care what I'm saying, who pensiero di vico di pace, right? But we don't want to know that there are rhythms because your character doesn't know what she's singing, right? Yeah. So, who pensiero di vico di pace? Who pensiero di vico di pace? Now, the eighth notes and sixteenth notes are not quite as accurate rhythmically as the way that she did it the first time, but if you sing it that way, we will hear text, we'll still hear the correct rhythm, and it will still line up just fine with piano. Okay. Uh, start again. And see if you can have just a broader approach to that text. Okay. So maybe there are two bars or yeah.